Hello and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channel's television. And Millicent will walk out first. The highlights. Taraba State laments inability to vaccinate half of its population, reacts to drop in performance ranking in ongoing mass vaccination campaign. Yobe government says outbreak of COVID-19 has hampered drugs administration for neglected tropical diseases in the state. And the World Health Organization warns that the recently discovered subvariant of the Omicron coronavirus strain could be more infectious, says it has been detected in 57 countries. Thank you for joining us. According to the top performing state on the COVID-19 mass vaccination campaign in Nigeria by the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, in the last one week, drawbacks have been experienced in Akwaibom, Benue, Kogi, Edo, Ekiti and Zamfara states, while states like Bochi, Kano and Yobe moved forward by two steps in their vaccination drive. According to the report, Plateau State joined 18 other states that have vaccinated at least 10% of the eligible population with the first dose. It also adds that the number of eligible persons who have not been vaccinated with the second dose is highest in the northwest state and lowest in the south-south state. Meanwhile, last night, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control confirmed 159 cases of COVID-19. Here's more on the pandemic update. 159 additional persons in Nigeria have tested positive to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. According to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the latest figures were reported from eight states and the FCT. That's an increase from the figures reported earlier. Lagos accounted for the highest number of cases with 57 infections. Yobe had 37, Rivers 27, while 14 cases were registered in Gombe and FCT. Kano, Bayelsa, Ekiti, Nasarawa logged a single-digit infection. The total confirmed cases in Nigeria now stand at 253,340. The report also includes a backlog of confirmed cases from Lagos State, a backlog of community discharges from the FCT, as well as zero cases from Delta, Kaduna, Ogun, Undo, Oshun, Oyo, Plateau, and Sokoto states. 255 patients have been discharged in the last 24 hours, increasing the total number of recoveries to 229,650. There was no additional death recorded in the last 24 hours, leaving the fatality toll at 3,136. Currently, there are over 20,000 active cases in Nigeria, while more than 4 million samples have been tested so far. Lagos State accounts for the highest number of cases on admission with over 17,000 positive samples, followed by the FCT and Ondo state. Over 15.2 million eligible Nigerians targeted for COVID-19 vaccination have received their first dose, while more than 5.6 million of the population have been fully vaccinated. In Africa, over 10.8 million persons have tested positive, while over 239,000 deaths have been recorded across countries on the continent. The total global confirmed cases have surpassed 381 million, while deaths are beyond 5.6 million. The Taraba State Primary Health Care Development Agency has lamented the drop in the bar chart of state's vaccination exercise. The Executive Secretary, Mr. Aminu Hassan, attributed factors such as inadequate manpower, topography of the state, insecurity, logistics, among several others, as the reason behind the fall. He says that so far, 170,000 residents have been vaccinated with the vaccines made available to them since the outbreak of the pandemic adding that allowances for outbreak response have not yet been paid to health workers, which also dampens their morale. Ms. Hassan further stresses that efforts are in top gear to influence the uptake of vaccines and ramp up a wider coverage of the exercise. So far, so good. We have done so much. If you can recall, Tarawa State was at the last lap when it comes to numbers in terms of number of people that have been vaccinated when we commence the mass vaccination exercise. But as I am speaking to you, uh, I've been sure we were 12th in the whole of the country 
in terms of mm, states that have covered widely, but we have started going down. Now we are number 17 in the whole of the country. But uh, that was attributed to so many factors, but we are not relenting on our hours. We'll continue to push to ensure that at least we vaccinate a whole number of people. When it comes to quantum of number of people that are vaccinated during the mass vaccination campaign, we have succeeded in vaccinating over 170 something thousand number of people with different categories of vaccines. The third issue that also become that, that helps in bringing down the morale of our staffs had to do with non-payment of OBR allowances, stipends. Almost three rounds of that allowance has all been paid to Taraba State, which is under the ambit of MPC and WHO for the past uh, almost three rounds. This is the fourth round. Even the non-polo SIA that was conducted up to now, the stipends for staff have not been paid. And these boys have been asking us a lot of questions in the field. That calls for concern. And that also helps to dampen their morale to some extent to start relaxing. Over to your base stage, where the government says the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in the last two years hampered drugs administration for neglected tropical diseases in the state thereby increasing the mortality and morbidity. The Executive Secretary of the state's primary health care management agencies, Dr. Babagana Kundi Machina, disclosed this at the commemoration of the 2022 neglected tropical diseases in the Mataru, the state capital. According to the World Health Organization, the COVID-19 pandemic has thrust millions of people deeper into poverty and affected those who already have limited access to health services. In Yobe State, the restriction of movement during the pandemic had hindered the sensitization of the public on tropical diseases, as well as the inaccessibility of drugs. At the commemoration of 2022 Neglected Tropical Diseases Day, the state government explains that vaccines and drugs of the tropical diseases were delayed with about six months in 2021 fiscal year. The uh, lead time to delivery of these drugs have, have increased significantly, which affected our campaign in 2021. So, but um, uh, eventually we were able to get, get it and we actually undertook the mass drug administration. So, of course, COVID-19 has affected it. And as I have said, the restriction, uh, there's also restriction in terms of the uh, gathering of people and, and all those, which actually also made it uh, more difficult uh, to deliver on the mass drug administration. But we are able to get around that. The state government is using the opportunity to remind the public to imbibe hygienic practices to curb the outbreak of diseases. The day is, is to put aside to create awareness and to sensitize communities and people on the danger associated with neglected tropical disease. Most of them has to do with um, the, way I'm, the issue of sanitation, the issue of personal hygiene, and the issue of water. These are the common reasons or predisposing factors to which these neglected tropical diseases are spreading across our communities and affecting causing disability, blindness, and sometimes affecting the social economic status of our people uh, in your state. According to the United Nations, an estimated 1.7 billion people remain at risk from neglected tropical diseases. The Yobe state government is calling on individuals and communities to encourage surveillance, testing and treatment for NTDs and renewed efforts to control and eliminate these diseases. Acting on the wrong information can kill. Recent research suggests that in the first three months of 2020, nearly 6,000 people around the globe were hospitalized because of the coronavirus misinformation. During this period, researchers say at least 800 people may have died due to misinformation related to COVID-19. At its extreme, death can be the tragic outcome of what the World Health Organization has termed the infodemic, an overabundance of information, some accurate, some not, that spreads alongside a disease outbreak. Though they aren't new in our digital age, infodemic spreads like wildfire. To talk more about this, Dr. Mariam Ushuri is a public health physician. Uh, thank you for joining us on the program. Good evening. Good evening. What role would you say that the COVID misinformation has, has led to vaccine hesitancy in, in the different parts of the country? Hello. 
COVID misinformation has just um I don't want to say it's further, it's further um, adding the work of the healthcare workers because the COVID misinformation keeps um, encouraging people to pass wrong information about COVID-19 vaccination. And then um, they keep Oh dear, I seem to be having a connection challenge with uh, Dr. Merriam Oshudi there. We'll try to uh, connect with her a little later. Um, I'm back. All right. Okay, we can hear you I'm now. Back. Dr. Oshudi, go ahead, please. Okay, so very, so very, very fast. Yeah, um, COVID misinformation has further um, increased vaccine hesitancy. People are having, we are experiencing delay in acceptance of vaccine, of COVID 19 vaccine, and as well as um, refusal of COVID 19 vaccine administration. There are so many um, information going on in social media, Twitter, and everywhere, and nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to pick one information. They are passed among themselves, and then they are not, they don't very, they don't even clarify or even verify the information they get. And so um, it has further increased um, the vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we are, I know the NCDC and their, um, several organizations have been working hard to ensure that a misinformation is um, corrected and that people get the right um, information regarding COVID-19 vaccination. And misinformation essentially is when it's unintentional and disinformation is totally when it's deliberately meant to skew uh, what is. But do you think that we're perhaps getting out of it? If you compare uh, early last year when the vaccines came into the country and where we are now? Okay, well, early last year when the vaccines came into in the country, precisely March 2021, I think about March we had, a, we had administered about 700,000 700, doses. And then it's at every month we're having about um, 500,000 doses, varying from 500,000 to about um, 800,000 doses of vaccine administration. Um, towards the end of the last quarter of, la, um, of 2021, the um, administration increased because there were different um, strategies that were employed by the, NC, the MPATDA and the various state governments. So, uh, about September, we had we had administered about 6.9 million um, doses. By October, it was we had added to about um, 8.6 million. By November, 9.8, and then you know we're get, we getting by, by December we had administered about 14.8 million doses. Now different strategies have been put in place for that. The mobile vaccination exercise kick started in the, um, the last quarter, same as. The, um, the mass vaccination campaign, which is still ongoing. And then, you know, all in, all in a way to ensure that vaccine gets to every, every individual, every eligible individual, irrespective of um, different challenges that they might be having. So I think um, compared to last year, we are still, we are, it's still work unfinished, uh, but we are, we are doing lots better. And as today we've vaccinated about 6%, doing 6% of our target population, but I know we can still do better. Indeed. We're also seeing 60% in Nasarawa have taken their first dose thus far. Um, what do you think uh, of the, the North Central states and, and why it's doing better than others? Okay, well, um, now it's multifactorial. Now, regarding first dose, a lot of people, um, you know, at the start of the COVID-19 vaccination, people actually waited to see what will happen to others have had the vaccines administered. And so um, we had the rush of the first dose, but several factors have now affected how the second, the uptake of the second dose um, factors coming from the vaccine factors and then the health worker factors and then the human factors itself. And if you look at vaccine factors, there are some areas where the non availability of those vaccines, particularly um, the different, but I know we are still administering but by the Pfizer brand, the AstraZeneca, and then the Moderna brand. And so at some point in time, we might run out of a particular um, vaccine and then we have, might have to tell them to come back at a later date. That's on that. Now on the health workers, um, of uh, on the health workers factor, yes, health workers are fatigued. There are so many concurrent programs going around. They're still having polio vaccination exercise. They still have to do their routine work. And then the remuneration for the health workers is pretty poor. And so it's, it's, it's further dampening their morale. They are not encouraged to carry out vaccination exercises. That's for all health workers that they usually uh, that are engaged for the um, COVID-19 vaccination. Now, other factors that have also affected this are the COVID misinformation and then misconception and perceived effectiveness. Some people felt, oh, I've had the first dose and 
uh, or rather they had had people had had the first dose and some people still passed away even after the, having the first dose or some people came down with COVID after the first and second dose, you know, and then people know, um, people don't um, all, um, understand the concepts behind the fact that there are different, um, there are different um, factors that, will have, that could have led to that. Now other factors are previous experiences from their first um, dose vaccination. Some might have experienced adverse effects following um, immunization, which we call the AFI, and there are different types. Um, the, you have the mild and the severe, depending on whatever um, the individual experiences. Now, such previous experiences would discourage people from coming back for the second dose or perhaps their booster doses. Now, there, um, there's another factor which we consider is the preference of vaccine delivery. Even in as much as vaccine and um, COVID-19 vaccine administration is free, people will still not want to come out. They will, still, they will want to be in their comfort zone and they will not want to um, access um, the um, vaccine administration. So now we have, it has to be that different um, strategies have been, have been put in place to carry it out. For example, like I mentioned, the mass vaccination campaign um, exercise like in Lagos started about um, October and then there have been different sites where people could come and get their vaccine. And then after a while, um, the mobile vaccine um, team is also on field. They go to different locations where there will be people gathered together and then they also administer um, the, the COVID-19 vaccine. At the moment, we are to reach um, COVID-19 vaccine Admission currently started this week, and then the, this aims to get to um, areas that are really hard to reach. Perhaps you might need to get there using a boat, a cano, or motorbikes in, in far so distant areas. Essentially, where you might not be able to yeah, essentially, Dr. Shodi, quite, you know, a number of factors. But, uh, you know, I'd like to suggest that one thing everybody needs uh, also is a break from COVID-19 itself. You know, that would really just be great. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Miriam Shodi, public health physician, joining us from Ikeja here in yeah, York. Still to come in just over two months since the first identified uh, WHO records now almost 90 million cases of the Omicron variant. We have that and more when we return. Welcome back. According to the World Health Organization Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, it says premature, it is premature for any country to declare victory against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which he says is dangerous and continues to evolve. At a press conference in Geneva, Dr. Tedros said since the Omicron variant was first identified just 10 weeks ago, almost 90 million cases have been reported to the body. Since Omicron was first identified just 10 weeks ago, almost 90 million cases have been reported to WHO, more than were reported in the whole of 2020. We are now starting to see a very worrying increase in deaths in most regions of the world. We're concerned that a narrative has taken hold in some countries that because of vaccines, 
and because of Omicron's high transmissibility and lower severity, preventing transmission is no longer possible and no longer necessary. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's premature for any country either to surrender or to declare victory. This virus is dangerous and it continues to evolve before our, our, our very eyes. WHO is currently tracking four sublineages of the Omicron variant of concern, including BA.2. This virus will continue to evolve, which is why we call on countries to continue testing, surveillance, and sequencing. We can't fight this virus if we don't know what it's doing. And we must continue to work to ensure all people have access to vaccines. Well, the average number of new infections reported each day in Kenya has fallen by more than 1,500 over the last three weeks, 55% of its previous peak. Now, COVID-19 infections are decreasing in Kenya with 138 new infections reported on average each day. That's 5% of the peak, the highest daily average reported on the 27th of December. Well, so far, there have been over 300,000 infections and over 5,000 coronavirus-related deaths reported in the country. Well, joining us to talk more about the situation from Nairobi, Dr. Uh, Loki Mwange, a general practitioner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's also good to see you, uh, Dr. Lucky. I know the last time we spoke, you had caught COVID. Um, how are you doing mm. now? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, I can't complain. I don't have long COVID. I don't have COVID. Yeah, I'm doing fine. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Talk to us about what we're seeing. Um, Kenya's COVID positivity rate is dropping, lower cases. Uh, I, I mean, the lowest was recorded last Sunday. How are you matching the statistics mm -hmm. with the, the current hospitalization rate? Uh, well, uh, these statistics actually match because I'm, uh, currently uh, we're talking about a very low uh, positivity rate. Uh, we're talking about a positivity rate of around 2.8%. And um, as of the latest press release, uh, we were having 438 hospitalizations with uh, quite a low number being in ICU. And um, uh, also another low number being on ventilatory support. We're talking about um, 438 being admitted. We're talking about 4,000, around 4,000 being on home-based care. We're talking about uh, around two patients, actually two patients being in the HDU and 11 patients being in the ICU. So yes, those statistics are matching. Personally, um, uh, even in my practice, uh, the COVID, positive patients, uh, the patients who are COVID positive and you can blame their symptomatology on COVID have gone quite low. So yes, those statistics are matching with what's on the ground. Are you comfortable with news that is going around saying that, you know, Omicron is a little milder, even faster transmissibility, and this is the cause of it? Um, I mean, Kenya has so far seen five waves uh, of the coronavirus mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, so do you think that the country is better prepared to, to handle things? Uh, certainly, certainly yes, certainly yes. Uh, because um, when you start uh, thinking about uh, contingency measures and how to prepare for things, one, you have to look, for, you have to look at the virulence of this COVID-19. You have to look at the transmissibility and you have to also factor in whether you can you can stop this uh, cycle from, from propagating. So now, um, when you look at the virulence, you can see that the Omicron actually is really mild. And uh, coming from the uh, infectious disease specialists and uh, the pathologists, the virologists, we've seen Dr. Ahmed Kalebi. We've also seen Professor Walter Jaoko, who have come forth and said that uh, we are currently um, approaching the Basically, we're in the decline phase of this COVID, uh, what most people would uh, call herd immunity. We're actually approaching it. So um, uh, I think things are looking up. Uh, we definitely have the capacity to manage it. 
because um, uh, if you if just from what I've just said, you're seeing that uh, quite a really high number, around 10 times the positive, 10 times the guys who are in hospital, the guys who have been hospitalized are being managed in home-based care. That in itself shows you that uh, we are now um, able to manage this Omicron at home. Uh, part of the reasons being the fact that uh, the immunity has actually gone high. People catching COVID are people who have gotten it either before having active immunity or people who have been vaccinated like myself. So um, we don't expect it to be a really big thing. Uh, we expect that uh, even the new variants, once they come, we shall be able to handle them. All right. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucky Moange, is a general practitioner joining us from Nairobi. Many thanks again. Thank you so much. And France has become the latest European country to begin lifting anti-COVID restrictions despite a high number of infections from Wednesday. That's today. Face masks will no longer be mandatory outdoors across the country, while working from home is now only a recommendation. Here's more on the global update. The World Health Organization says a subvariant of Omicron has now been detected in 57 countries. In some countries, BA2 now accounts for over half of sequenced Omicron cases. According to a study in Denmark, the first country where the subvariant overtook the original, it appears more transmissible than the original Omicron strain and more able to infect the vaccinated. The UK government has written off £8.7 billion spent on protective equipment during the pandemic. A large portion of this is because the government's paid more for the items than they are currently worth, now that the global supplies are recovered. Meanwhile, government figures show estimated UK COVID infections have risen to more than 3 million last week. France is the latest European country to ease COVID restrictions with rules on masks outdoors being lifted and home working no longer compulsory. The number of Omicron infections in France is still very high, around a third of a million a day. But because the strain is proving less harmful than previous variants, the pressure on hospitals has been contained. Elsewhere in Europe, coronavirus cases have reached a new all-time high in Germany with 208,498 more reported within 24 hours. This has taken it over the 10 million mark for total infections. The seven-day incidence rate also hit an all-time high of 1,227.5 cases per 100,000 residents. Well, you can visit our website. It's channelcv.com for more updates, a better understanding of the pandemic. There are breaking stories, but then there's also uh, the coronavirus updates. We can see Beijing Olympics begin torch relay, and this is amidst COVID-19 fears in that country. That's our program. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Stay healthy.